Hi there! Welcome to episode 8 of the Waveback Music Podcast. Today's games are Super Mario Brothers for the Nintendo Entertainment System and Super Mario Land for the Game Boy. Enjoy! <laughs> Hello again! This is the Waveback Music Podcast, a show where we listen to and reminisce about some of the best video game music there is. My name is Chris, and I am your host. We are live once again, broadcasting directly from Geekade.com, which means I'm joined tonight by the one and only DJ Vestlord. He'll be supplying the tunes while I supply the endless rambling. And boy do I have some rambling for tonight's topic. Tonight is special for a couple of reasons. First, it's our very first double feature, where we'll be playing music from not one, but two games, and comparing them as we go. Second, the games we're listening to are nothing short of legendary. For tonight, we discuss Super Mario Bros. and Super Mario Land. Why these two? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First, I like to try to do games that are more well-known for our live episodes, and keep the more obscure stuff for the pre-recorded shows. Now, since we started this podcast, I've been wanting to do a Mario game, but where to start? I can't really do Donkey Kong, because there's really only about 30 seconds of music in the entire game. Mario Brothers is a similar problem, but Super Mario? Well, that would be great. But again, there really wasn't quite enough music to fulfill an entire episode, so I got to thinking, what if I did two games? I could do Super Mario Brothers 1 and 2, but that seemed a little too obvious. Plus, Super Mario 2 could probably be its own episode. I could have done Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda, which actually would have made for a really good episode, because I'm still not sure what I'm going to pair the original Zelda with. Maybe I'll give it its own episode. I'll figure it out another time. Anyway, then I thought about Super Mario Land, and a light switch went on. It's perfect, because it's basically an alternate universe version of the Super Mario Bros. soundtrack. And so here we are. So let's take a quick step back and look at a little bit of history. Super Mario Bros. was released for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985 by Nintendo. It was a sequel to the arcade game Mario Bros. But, while it carried over several elements from that game, it was a very different experience. The game was developed by Nintendo R&D 4, which was a development studio centered around Shigeru Miyamoto's ideas. The game's music was composed by the legendary Koji Kondo. And if you don't know who that is, this is... Well, this is primarily the thing he's known for, but he's also the guy that wrote, um, in addition to the Super Mario Brothers theme, one of the most brilliant pieces of mus- video game music ever conceived. You may also know him from The Legend of Zelda, Super Mario Brothers 2 and 3, Super Mario World, Star Fox 64, and so and so forth. Super Mario Brothers was the first adventure ever in the Mushroom Kingdom. It introduced us to characters like Princess Peach, then known as Princess Toadstool, Bowser, Goombas, Koopa Troopas, and more. It is as legendary as they come, as is its soundtrack. Super Mario Land was released for the Game Boy in August of 1989 as a launch title for the handheld. It was charged with creating a proper Mario experience on the go, and was developed by Nintendo R&D 1. The music was composed by the also legendary Hirokazu Hiptanaka, who you may know from Metroid, Kid Icarus, Dr. Mario, and many more, including Balloon Kid, the topic of our very first episode. Super Mario Land took the challenging approach of trying to properly emulate the original Super Mario Bros. style on the limited power of the Game Boy, and it did so with some incredibly creative design choices. To save on processing power, turtle shells exploded instead of being kicked around. Super Balls replaced fireballs so they could move in a more linear linear pattern. Uh, The visuals and playstyle are very close to the original Super Mario Bros., more so than any other game in the franchise, but it was always like they were coming from some sort of alternate dimension. This includes the soundtrack. What makes this such a fascinating pairing is that this is basically... Super Mario Land is basically Hip Tanaka emulating Koji Kondo, while keeping his own distinct flavor. Uh, For every track in Super Mario Bros., there's a corresponding track in Super Mario Land, and they are all wonderful and unique in their own way. But that's enough talk. Let's get down to business. Our first track needs no introduction, but always deserves one. We're beginning with probably the most famous piece of music in all of video games, but it's more than that. It's it's a genuinely amazing piece, with lots of complexity to boot. It's jazzy, it's catchy, it's playful in all the right places. Seriously, when was the last time you actually stopped and listened to this song? Just really listen to it. It's one of those known quantities that's so ingrained in the social consciousness, most can recite it at least the beginning of it from memory, but it deserves so very much more. So really listen to it. 
pay attention to the way all the pieces fit together, the drum changes, the brilliant bass line. Without further ado, enjoy from Super Mario Bros. Main Theme and Overworld. Is there to say about that song? <laughs> well, actually, quite a bit. So I'm going to say things. Uh, that song was. Um, it means a lot for for a lot of different reasons. I mean, I know that for me, it was a. It was kind of just a complete revelation. And when you really think about it, the uh, that song set the stage for video game music in general. Like so much pl- platformers and so many games drew their inspiration from that main song and it's just permeated everything it's it's a song that everybody knows so what's so cool about this is that this is the the next track that we're going to listen to is going to go is going to be the the analog from Super Mario Land which is called Birabuto Kingdom now when making the the whole Super Mario Land game it was kind of like this whole different version of Super Mario Brothers. So Mario looked the same. Like I said earlier, it was almost like a, a, a bizarre alternate universe version of Super Mario Brothers, which didn't, at least to me, seem so strange at the time, because, you know, the order that I'd played Super Mario Brothers in, you had Super Mario Brothers, which was totally different from Mario Brothers, and Super Mario 2, which was totally different from Mario 1. So this series being very different from uh, iteration to iteration didn't really seem strange to me. So when I was in Super Mario Land rescuing Princess Daisy instead of Princess Peach and fighting the alien Tatanga instead of uh, Bowser or even Wart, it didn't seem that weird because really, how is is that weirder than Bowser or Wart heading through Subcon and Dream Worlds? Not really. But 
this game hearkened back to Super Mario 1 more than Super Mario 2 here in the USA did, the, the our Doki Doki Panic version of Super Mario 2. So this was kind of just a really interesting throwback, and knowing what I know now about the composers of these pieces, this this whole thing is just this interesting riff off of Koji Kondo. It's, it's Hip Tanaka doing his own version of that type of music. So Birabudo Kingdom is basically this the main theme in overworld the super mario brothers theme of super mario land and you'll hear a lot of similarities in the way it, it works like as a song like it, it kind of has that same jazzy feel to it what you know just just very kind of jumpy and whatnot it's a little bit less laid back than the regular super mario brothers theme and it is just it's pure hip tanaka but with just a, a hint of koji kondo in it. it's it's difficult to explain but it is such 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 a good track so here is track number 2 birabuto kingdom <laughs> And again, that is Birabuto Kingdom from Super Mario Land, which is the analog to the main theme in Overworld from Super Mario Brothers. And what's what's so fun about Game Boy music in particular is that there's a lot of similarities between the Game Boy and NES sound chips, but there's something about the Game Boy sound chips, I think it's the bass that just always gets me. Um, it just has a much more, uh, I guess, almost a crunchy tone to it. Uh, it's it's really hard to describe, but you can really hear the differences. Like when when you're trying to listen to, oh, well, here's what a, the same song sounds like coming out of both both systems. Ah, oh, but I digress. <laughs> so yes, Birabuto Kingdom uh, would be the analog to the main theme in Overworld, and it, Kondo's stuff is just so very, uh, I guess, quintessential. Whereas. Um, Hip Tanaka's stuff is is almost a little bit more playful than the main theme in Overworld. It's definitely not as long or complex as the Super Mario Brothers um, song, but it's still just I don't know. It it might it's a little bit more quirky. It almost has like it has more character. But to say which one I like better than the other, I mean, you're comparing between two of like the biggest video game songs in all of history. But anyway, let's move on to tracks number three and four. Uh, first, we're going to do track number three, which is going to be Underground from Super Mario Brothers. It's a very short track, and one I'm sure everybody knows extraordinarily well. Um, and it's basically this this music that plays for any underground segments in Super Mario Brothers. So you finish the first stage, you go down the flagpole, you go down a pipe, and then all of a sudden you're in this weird blue and black underground cave thing. And um, background is just solid black, and there's blue bricks everywhere, and this music, this very simple, yet extraordinarily catchy music plays. And this is what's interesting from here on out, from um, as far as the Super Mario Brothers soundtrack is concerned, is that with the exception of maybe Underwater, no other music for the rest of this game is as complex or interesting as the main theme in Overworld, which is relatively understandable considering that that's the piece that plays through the majority of the game, but there's an awful lot of stages that are that use this underground music that you're about to hear, and there's really not much to it. So uh, we'll, we'll continue talking about it in a second. Here is track number three, Underground. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, yeah, that track, when you really break it down, is really only a couple of seconds long, but... And, and no matter how many times it loops, it always just kind of made sense for for the kind of area that it was. Now, the corresponding track in Super Mario Land is... I don't know if it's necessarily a cheat. It's it might it's it's actually an even shorter piece of music than Underground is, uh, and it's called Coin Room. It's it, the reason it's a, a corresponding track is because th the only time that this music is really used is, see now when you go to the Underground music in Super Mario Brothers, there could be a couple of different situations, and a lot of those situations are coin rooms, just a single screen where you just run around collecting coins and then you go into a pipe and that's the end of it. Uh, the other ones are actual stages where this music is used, but in Super Mario Land, Coin Room is only used for Coin Rooms. There aren't any real underground stages the same way that there are in Super Mario Brothers. Um, so this song is naturally a little bit shorter because you'll never really spend as much time in one of those rooms as you would an underground stage in Super Mario Brothers. But still, it's a... Um, it's an interesting track and has a little bit of interesting trivia to it, which we'll get into in just a moment. So here is track number four, Coin Room. Now, this is such an interesting track because, as you heard, it's only a few seconds long, but... For all of the amazing, amazing music that's in Super Mario Land, this is the only track that is reprised in Super Mario Land 2, um, which is in almost every way a, a, a superior game than Super Mario Land, except in the music department, because the music in Super Mario Land 2 is nowhere near as cool as it is in Super Mario Land 1. Anyway, moving on, um, the next direct analog that you'll that you'll get from game to game would be the castle stages. So in Super Mario 1, you'll play the first stage, which will have the main theme, second stage, which will have the underground theme, third stage goes right back to the main theme in Overworld, and the fourth stage, level 1-4, is a castle. And it is your first castle of the entire experience. And as you're playing through the castle, you'll hear the music that we're about to hear, called Castle. It's another very short theme, which is uh, another interesting approach to it, because these stages can be long, especially later on in the game. Some of these stages will actually repeat themselves if you don't travel through it the right path, and so this music can go on for a very long time, and it's very stressful, and and it's it's intended to be. You know, these are these are the highest stakes stages in the game, as far as I'm concerned, and this castle music is very, it's kind of haunting, but really the way that the the sound chip just kind of hits these bleeps at you, it doesn't try to sound, like, calm in any way, shape, or form, or spooky. It's just very haunting and frightening, and they, it just kind of makes you want to move. Like, the time limit always seems so foreboding when you're playing these castle stages because of this music. So, here is track number five, Castle. <laughs> So all the castles in this game look exactly the same, and they, they have a very old-school 8-bit-looking castle look to them. Just flat black in the background, all these gray brick patterns all over the place, but not your regular bricks, or really the pattern that makes up these stages is only used in these castle stages. And it's, you know, there's, it's, it's this stark red of the lava and the fire against the gray, that really, and the gray and the black that really makes these stages work. It was... It was a very minimalist approach because of the limitations at the time, but it worked to such a degree. Now, the Super Mario Land analog to this is going to be Easton Kingdom. Now, there, this is used slightly differently than it was in Super Mario Brothers, as there isn't like a typical, and here is the castle at the end of the stage every single time. Like Sometimes it, it's, it switches up a little bit. But when you're playing through Super Mario Land, the first, you know, the the end of the f end of World One is a what you would call a castle stage, but more like a, a pyramid than it is a castle. So, since it was a black and white Game Boy, there was no you know, solid black background or anything like that. They have like hieroglyphics and things like that going on in the background, and and 
different, just kind of pyramidy looking bricks and blocks that would fall down on you. And the music has a much more, I guess, Egyptian flair to it. It sounds more like a temple than it does a spooky lava filled castle. And it's kind of cool. Uh, the music is reprised several times throughout the game, sometimes even in an out in outdoor stages, just as like foreboding music. Now this is is definitely more spooky and less. Oh my God, gotta run! Oh, I'm in danger! And this is really th- this kind of song is is definitely more along the lines of this is spooky. Something is something big is on the way. It's very foreboding music. So um, here is track number six, Eastern Kingdom. <laughs> considerably more complex than the castle stage. Well, I guess not really considerably more, because when you really listen to the castle music, even though it's it's short, it's very complicated. There's a lot going on in it. And the Eastern Kingdom one is definitely more chill, but a little bit more foreboding, as opposed to the imminent danger that castle makes you feel. But I really like that song. It's a very, it's a very, very good song. It's, you know, just hits the exact feel of the stage so perfectly, which is something that both Kondo and Tanaka do extremely well. But as you're hearing, they both do it in their own very unique sort of way. Like, the, obviously the Super Mario Land stuff is meant to kind of reflect the patterns and the type of music that was made in Super Mario Brothers, but it's all done it, it with his own distinct personality to it and it's it's so fascinating to listen to and it's so great to listen to these just going back and forth but we're going to take a a brief uh moment away from the whole going back and forth thing because Super Mario Land actually has a few extra tracks in it that don't correspond to other tracks in Super Mario Brothers and these tracks would be just an absolute shame to miss because there's some of the most interesting tracks that you're going to hear all night long the first one we're going to listen to is our track number seven, which is Muda Kingdom. Now, as you go through the Super Mario Land, the different overworlds have different musics. Unlike Super Mario Brothers, where the main theme and overworld is the same in every single world, um, when you travel to different worlds in Mario Land, Tanaka just cranked out a, a handful of extra tunes. And this track number seven, if it wasn't for track number one being the Super Mario Brothers theme, this would probably be my favorite song of the night. Um, it's it's very straightforward, it's not a very long track, but it is pure hip Tanaka in, in just the most delightful way. It's it's the same way that he did with Balloon Fight, that, you know, just playing a game on a, a sunny afternoon kind of a thing. This song is just another one of those perfect examples of that kind of song. It's so, so good, it's so simple and so effective. Um, I can't. I, I will stop gushing about it, and you should listen to it. Here is track number seven, Muda Kingdom. Thank you. 
about one of the most joyous songs in, in all of Soundtractum. I love this song to death. I have such distinct memories of playing, uh, spending a lot of time on this stage when the Super Game Boy came out. So the Super Game Boy was this thing that lets you uh, plug your Game Boy games into the Super Nintendo and play them in four-color color on your TV screen. And the default setup for Super Mario Land was perfect for the first stage, except that when you got to the second stage, Muda Kingdom was clearly set over water, and the water was all red with the default coloring. So I would uh, change up the the colors to make the water look blue, and for, for some reason, the combination of the blue water, um, the spaceship... See, this is another really interesting thing about this stage. It's, just, it's not explained in any way, shape, or form. You finish the first stage, uh, the, the, the first world, the um, Birabuto Kingdom, and then you move on to the Muda Kingdom, and when you start, you're standing underneath a, a little UFO, like a flying saucer, like you were just beamed there on top of this tree for no reason, no explanation. It's just, and now you're standing under this spaceship with this little, like, beam that's hovering over Mario, looking like he was just teleported there. It's so weird and just so delightful at the same time because you didn't need a real explanation for it. You know, it's it's kind of like you don't need to know why Bowser keeps p- kidnapping the princess. It's just, it's just part of the world. It's just the way that it is. And it's it's just pure delight. I, I love it so much. Now, this next track is probably one of the most... I would say it's the most ethnic-sounding song of any Mario game that I've ever listened to. Uh, the Track number eight is going to be Chai Kingdom from Super Mario Land, and this is just... It's so Asian. <laughs> it's ridiculous, and I don't mean to sound that in any sort of... It is, it is a very stereotypical Asian-flavored song, and... It's the the stages are also adorned with all these like very very I I think it's intended to look Chinese um and and I apologize if I'm getting this wrong if it's supposed to look Japanese but I feel like this is really supposed to look like a very Chinese setting and the way that the like the symbols and stuff are drawn on the on the outlines of the stages and you the little karate guys jumping up and down at you which. Uh, look like they look like little girls in the game but if you if you look at the cover for Super Mario Land they're these actually like these blue creatures in these chinese outfits or whatever again i i feel like it looks more chinese in nature but i could be wrong if it's intended to be more japanese and i apologize for offending every anybody or everybody but still chai kingdom is is it's very overtly ethnic in in style like a lot of the music in uh, most of the music in Mario games is all very based on like jazz or just very upbeat or or atmospheric music, and you usually don't hear something that's very distinctly um, ethnic. That's that's based on a very specific type of music, like an area's type of music, and this is a very rare exception. And it's a brilliant piece. It's it's a wonderful piece of music, and it fits the stage very well. But it's it's always stuck out to me as one of the stranger things to be playing a Mario game to. Even at the time, this one felt less universal than Mario stages usually do. So, here you go, one of the most interesting tracks in all of Super Mario, Chai Kingdom.
And there is Chai Kingdom from Super Mario Land. It is... I mean, if you've never heard this piece before, I'm, I'm sure you're, you can understand now what I mean by it it's just being an extraordinarily ethnic piece of music. It's just, just astonishing. Um, but it's a really catchy tune, and, and when you play through the game, it really matches what's going on, and it's... I don't know. I, I really like the track. It's certainly not my favorite, but it's it's just so interesting and really sticks with you. Now, speaking of sticking with you, track number nine, we're going back to the uh, Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario Land comparison straight up now, and track number nine is going to be the Underwater theme, which is another one of the most famous songs from Super Mario Brothers. In fact, uh, this song was used as the main theme for like the title screen of Super Mario Bros. 2. Uh, and when you played Super Mario All-Stars, they used versions of this music as the title screen music for all the Mario games. It's, it's a great piece, and it's a, it's a waltz. It's, again, probably one of the first waltzes that I, uh, that's ever been heard in a video game. But it's, it's another just piece of pure genius on Koji Kondo's part, because it it set the stage for what underwater music in video games was supposed to sound like. And it just went from there. You listen to underwater songs, even other ones that have been done in Mario games in the future that weren't written by Kondo, or just underwater themes in general. They tend to harken back to this. This is exactly what you expect this music to, to sound like for this kind of world. And these underwater stages, like, I mean, for me, I remember the first time getting to an underwater stage and not knowing that it was coming, you know? You play through the you know, level 1-1, one, 1-2, one, 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 then you go to 2-1, and you feel like you're going to follow the same pattern, you get to the end of the stage, you go down a pipe, and then all of a sudden, you're underwater! And it's just this bright blue, and the, the, all the, the hard ground is green, and there's all these bright pink seaweeds. It's, it's so brilliantly colorful, and this music matches it perfectly. So here is another brilliant piece from Koji Kondo, Underwater. And that was track number nine, Underwater, from Super Mario Brothers by Koji Kondo. And what a track that is. It's, ah, uh, you can just listen to it. Very relaxing, which is really saying something, because those underwater stages could get very intense, with the bloopers chasing after you, and cheap jeeps all over the place, and the whirlpools that you can't see pulling you underwater while you're trying to get the, um, the coins and whatnot. Um, but the, the color scheme on these stages paired with this music are just so, so brilliant. Just wonderfully done. Now, the corresponding stage on here, to go back to what I had said earlier about the way they program this game with the with certain physics and stuff being changed, like the turtle shells and that would explode, or the super balls replacing the fireballs, so they just moved in the straight line pattern and never like slowed down or bounced like the fireballs did. It was just an easier thing for the limited processing power of the Game Boy to understand. For the underwater stages, programming underwater physics the same way that they did in Super Mario Brothers, I mean, at least at the time, probably was just unthinkable, uh, because they, they just didn't do it. I mean, when you really think about it, the whole underwater segment, they really added... There was gravity and weight to Mario. You'd press the button and he would, you know, flap his arms and swim like he would, like, go up and float and then float back down and get faster and faster as he went. And there was nothing like that in Super Mario Land. There were no, like, physics program like that. So the way they handled underwater was marine pop or sky pop. 
Marine Pop was this little uh, submarine that you would just fly around in, and it would become these auto-scrolling shooter stages, kind of like R-Type or whatever, except you're Mario in a little ship. You're the, and, and they used this song in both the underwater stage and the sky stage, which are both, they both control exactly the same. You just kind of move your ship around just like in a, a, a traditional scrolling shooter, except it's a Mario game. So you can occasionally shoot bricks and a mushroom will pop out and you and your marine pop or sky pop will get bigger or you get hit and you get smaller. And it's so weird and, and really, really cool to have this in the middle of a Mario game. Because these stages were very, very fun, and this music is very high energy. It's extremely fast-paced and just really, really fun. Like, these stages almost seemed like bonus stages. In fact, this music could be considered very bonus stage E when you think about it, but it's just for a whole stage, and it just plays and loops, and it's wonderful, it's brilliant, it's so well put together, and and just, just the right level of complexity and hearkening right back to um, the main theme of Super Mario Brothers. Like, very, very small touches. I would think this song probably has the most melodically in common with the main theme and overworld from Super Mario Brothers, but it's still its very, very own unique flavor. So, enjoy track number 10, Marine Pop, Sky Pop. <laughs> Listening to this song, you're flying around. The screen's not even scrolling that fast when you when you do this, and this is one of those great examples of how music can really affect a game. Because if you play this stage on mute, it has a totally different feeling than when you listen to, when you have the music playing. Because this music adds so much energy to the stage, it makes you want to mash on that button and blow up as many bricks and bad guys as you can. Whereas if you have it on mute, it just kind of seems it feels slower because it, it, the, the screen, like I said, is not moving very fast. But this was this is probably the biggest contrast because it's such a different song than the underwater song because of the way the underwater stages were handled so incredibly different from game to game. And I'd be really curious to hear what um, Tanaka would have done if the underwater stages in this game had been more like the other underwater, underwater stages in Super Mario Brothers. It would just have it would have been a very interesting thing to hear. Like, would he have done a waltz? Would he have done something slower? Would he have done something faster? Like I don't know. I would love to ask the man that question. I would love to, to hear what his take would have been. But alas, I don't speak Japanese nor do I know him in person. So <laughs> that's likely never going to happen. So, our next two tracks both have the same name. One is Invincible, the other is Invincible. We are moving on to the Invincibility, and boy things are about to get strange, because the invincibility track in Super Mario Brothers has been a stalwart throughout the entire series. For pretty much every game I can think of, even Super Mario Kart games, when you're invincible, this is the music that plays. Except in Super Mario Land. So, let's start with the Super Mario Brothers version. Here is track number 11, Invincible. <laughs> So this is one of those songs that's um, deceptively simple because there was a there was this version of Su the Super Mario Brothers soundtrack that I had listened to once and, and I don't remember who, I don't really know who put it together but basically it it broke down the songs piece by piece and when this one came on it just started with the bass line and I didn't recognize it I had no idea what it was just based off of the bass line and then as the other pieces of it came in I recognized the song as a whole. So really, when you listen to this track, it, it's 
it's got the the way these pieces fit together is is brilliant, and it's it's something that Koji Kondo was so good at doing is so good at making all these different melodies and stuff piece together. Like, you know, when we were talking about the main theme in Overworld, when you listen to just how complex the little the the rhythms are that are that are playing against one another, the two melodies, like the the main melody and then the underlying melody, the way they fit together and make this one cohesive whole, when you separate the two of them, both parts are, are actually quite genius. And the same could be said of our track, too, with the Birabudo Kingdom, is you know the way Tan- um, Tanaka made that same kind of thing happen with the two opposing parts, including the, the kind of like really jumpy bass line. When I first heard that song, there were certain notes that I used to think were part of the main melody that actually turned out to be part of a, uh, the sub-melody. It's it's also such very interesting music. I go back and listen to tracks number one and two as many times as you can, because they're really, really just phenomenally more deep than they sound. They're just really, really good stuff. Anyway, back to what we were talking about uh, before I sidetracked myself with the deceptively complex Invincible. Now we're going to go to just it is exactly what it is. So we're just going to play it. This is what the invincibility music is in Super Mario Land. Here is track number 12, Invincible. <laughs> Um, that's the can can. <laughs> there is no question about it. And I have no earthly idea why Tanaka decided to go with the can can for invincibility in this game. The invincibility music had already been established, and I believe it's been used as the same thing ever since. But for some reason, you grab a star man in Super Mario Land, and Mario's doing the can can. I don't even know what else to say about it, so we're just going to move on. All right. Track number 13. Uh, Tracks number 13 and 14 are also going to be very short tracks. We're going to blow through these very quickly. Uh, And 13 and 14 are going to be level complete. So these are going to be the little tunes that play whenever you finish a regular stage. Not a castle stage, just a regular stage. So you get yourself the flagpole, and this is the music that plays. Here is track 13, Super Mario Bros. Level Complete. And that is oh <laughs> that that song has come to uh signify a lot of relief in my world because boy when you get to the end of some of the later levels in Super Mario Brothers Super Mario Brothers is a hard hard game. I know a lot of people that always feel embarrassed by saying they've never beaten Super Mario Brothers and I always remind them that's nothing to be ashamed of. That game is actually pretty freaking tough. And when you move on to the Lost Levels, the Japanese Super Mario 2, that's not even fair. Like, that game's just unreasonable. But that song right there, it's, just, it's the perfect amount of relief. It's a very short track. It just goes goes by in an instant, just long enough for Mario to walk into the castle, it counts up your score, maybe get a couple of uh, fireworks, and move on to the next stage. Brilliant, brilliant piece of music. Now, the Super Mario Land equivalent is good, but it is extremely more simple. Track number 14, right now, level complete from Super Mario Land. And that's it. So, nice, quick, easy, to the point, not really a whole lot to it. Um, Yeah, uh, I guess the way that it balances it out is, and I didn't include this track in, in tonight's soundtrack because we're going through a lot of really short tracks and that would be another one is uh, whenever you completed a level uh, when you when you did the whole level complete thing in Super Mario Land there was um, two different doors one all the way at the top of the screen and one all the way at the bottom so whereas in Super Mario Brothers you would try to get as high as you could on the flagpole in order to get more points in Super Mario Land you would always try to get to the top door because there was a bonus game after it where it had this really fast repetitive music playing and you would try to like stop Mario on one of these paths to either get, you know, a handful of extra lives or a a super flower or whatever. And they were really they were really cool. It was an interesting little breakup between the stages, but if you didn't get to that door and you had to go in the bottom door, you would literally just get this little track and then move right on to the next stage. So it was, you know, 
it was all right. It was something. It kind of fit in with the, the motif of being fast-paced as a portable game. But really, you you can't top that level complete music from Super Mario Brothers. Definitely, definitely got to give the nod to Kondo on that one. So moving on to tracks 15 and 16, uh, these are going to be the songs that you hear when you complete castles uh, or or final stages, like the the last stage before you start over back at you know something one like two dash one or three dash one. So the first one will be from Super Mario Brothers, and it's called Castle Complete. So here you go, track number 15, Castle Complete. <laughs> So what's interesting about this piece is that th- I feel like for a long time I didn't even really notice that this was a different song than the level complete song. Like for some reason in my head it was just it was all the completing a stage and it wasn't until way way later when I was actually downloading a soundtrack for Super Mario Brothers and I mean way later like this I you couldn't just download soundtracks back when back in 1985 when this came out. And I remember going through it and then listening to getting these two different tracks and be like, wow, those actually are two different songs. Same thing happened to me with Blaster Master. I never even realized that there was two different sets of boss music in Blaster Master. It just didn't even occur to me. But that's a that's that's a podcast for another podcast, as I like to say. Um, so now we're going to move on to the Super Mario Land equivalent. And the Super Mario Land stuff is actually a little bit different because now when you complete a castle in Super Mario Brothers... You know, you get to Bowser, you grab the axe, break down the bridge, and the music plays as Mario walks over to uh, the Toad or Mushroom Retainer, and or or even the Princess at that at that point. But that's when the music is taking place, like as the screen starts scrolling to the right. Now, this music um, in Super Mario Land, you'll get the there isn't really a thing. There just kind of seems to be a switch standing there. But you you hit the switch, and whatever bad guy you're fighting explodes and then the screen moves over and it starts playing this music like instead of you know sorry mario your princess the princess is another, is another castle in super mario land daisy always appears to be standing there for a few seconds until it turns out to actually be some weird bug monster and hops away so the music starts playing like this really pretty piece and then it just changes to oh no it's not actually daisy music so here is oh daisy Track number 16. Enjoy. So yes, that music plays when it is decidedly not Daisy. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's an interesting track. What I like about it is that... Um, and I I feel like this is a very Tanaka thing to do, is to kind of tease one song and then have it change into something else. Actually, no, it's it's not a very specifically Tanaka thing, because Kondo did it in Legend of Zelda. If you listen to the the Game Over music in Legend of Zelda, it's actually the beginning of the ending music in Legend of Zelda. And this is kind of a, a similar situation, is when you actually get to the end of this game, you get to hear where the music goes if Daisy's actually there. And it's it's really great, but we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Beforehand, we've got a few more tracks to hit. Tracks 17 and 18 are going to be the Mario Down songs. Like, these are the songs that play when you die. And the one in Super Mario Brothers is one of the more brilliant things that Kondo did by really tying the soundtrack together and making it work as part of the music, because, well, let's play the track first. Here's track number 17, Super Mario Brothers, Mario Down. So, as you'll notice, that's actually a part of the main theme and overworld song. That that sound, that song is actually just part of the music, but played a little bit differently for whenever you die. So it's almost like the music is getting a chance to resolve every time you die, and then start back over again, which is very, very smart. It's just such a smart way of tying the whole soundtrack together, which we're going to hit again in, in just a moment. But first, let's listen to the analog in Super Mario Land. Here's track number 18, Mario Down. It's it's much shorter. It's much shorter than the uh, the the Super Mario Brothers one, and it also doesn't really tie into any specific music. But at the same time, it's got it's it's very endearing. 
sort of like the very, very quick level complete song from uh, Super Mario Land. They're, it's another one of those ones that really just sticks with you, but nowhere near to the extent of the Mario down in Super Mario Brothers, because unlike that one, this one isn't adding to an overall soundtrack narrative, like a musical narrative that Super Mario Brothers has, which is then resolved completely in our next track, track number 19, Game Over from Super Mario Brothers. Because when you listen to it, even tempo-wise, it matches with the rest of the music in the game. So as you're listening to this, as you're listening to this music, and if you die, like you could actually die at the right point in the music to replace the part of the music that sounds just like the dying sound, and then it'll move right on to the game over music like it's one continuous song. So here is track number 19, Game Over from Super Mario Brothers. So as you can hear, that really just kind of flows together like the end of the Super Mario Brothers song, which in and of itself is designed to loop continuously, but if it needed to resolve, you have a resolution for it right there in the Game Over soundtrack, which is amazing. It's just, it's so smart, and considering that nobody had ever done a video game soundtrack like this before, Kondo pioneered this so intelligently, and it's it's just amazing. Now, this next one, track number 20, is going to be the Game Over music from Super Mario Land, and it is also, uh, it feels more like a um, a riff off of the Game Over music from Super Mario Brothers, but not in a way that really plays to an overarching musical narrative like Super Mario Brothers has, because Super Mario Land really doesn't have that one overarching theme that ties the whole thing together. But... It's still a pretty good game over music because it's just barely... It's it's just discouraging enough to make you feel sad that you got a game over, but also it's not so sad that it, it just it just ever so slightly encourages you to hit start and continue and, and, and just go for it one more time. So here is track number 20, Game Over from Super Mario Land. <laughs> Short, sweet, simple, to the point, and genius all the way through. So we're coming up on our last two tracks of the night, and these are both the tracks for the endings of both Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario Land. And while Super Mario Brothers has definitely taken... It's had the better music in a lot of the instances, especially on some of the smaller stuff, and having an overall musical narrative. The ending piece, as classic as the ending music of Super Mario Brothers is, the ending to Super Mario Land is, oh, it's it's on another level entirely. It is a, it is a genius piece of music. But first, the ending to Super Mario Brothers. When you finally take down Bowser, when you finally do it in that last stage, because that last castle, 8-4, that's tough business. And then you get to that one last Hammer Brother, and if you don't have fireballs, he is a pain in the ass to get past. Because he's just standing there all by himself, and you just have to wait for the right break in his hammers or his jump to get past him. And then you get to Bowser, and he's just throwing hammers and breathing fire all over the place. And you finally get there, and you finally get to Princess, and she's standing there, and she looks all funny looking, because that sprite was weird looking for the princess in that game. And it just starts playing this cute little song. Just, It's kind of romantic. Like, it almost lends itself to, like, Mario and the princess were a couple. Kind of like, I feel like this music is what what made that seem like a thing more than anything. Like, you know, here's this plumber guy who's out to save this princess. Why is he saving the princess? Is it because he's a good guy? Is it because, you know, the king asked him to or whatever? Or is it because the two of them are are together? Or the two of them are a couple? This feels, always felt to me like a kind of a romantic song, which suggested the relationship between Mario and Peach, which... I mean, really, there's not much to think about. It's not an overly complicated cast of characters, but, you know, for the time when your imagination was all you had to fill the gaps, like things weren't as spelled out, uh, this music really helped piece together what you have kind of felt like you should be feeling at the end of Super Mario Brothers. So here is track number 21, Ending. So yeah, it's a very it's a very relieving song, it's a very calm song. You know, but but it also kind of 
it's a little on the abrupt side. Like you, you finish the game, and and that's pretty much it. You stand there next to the princess, and there's nothing, there's nothing past it. That's just where it stops until you you know, move on to your second quest, and then the game just starts right over again with higher difficulty each time. Now, on the opposite side of the spectrum, and now it was a few years later, so Tanaka and 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 company definitely had a few years to to improve on this kind of thing, but. What you're about to listen to, our last track of the night, track number 22, Rocket Ship Ride, is amazing. It starts off with the piece that we heard before of Oh Daisy, but instead of moving on to the you know dark, oh my god, she turned to a spider and hopped away music, it moves on to this brilliant soaring piece. And it, it it's definitely soaring because it, as instead of just standing there next to each other mimicking the last screen of Super Mario Brothers, which it seems to start to at first, Mario and Daisy then walk over to the right of the screen, hop into a plane, and fly away. <laughs> and it's just the cutest thing. And this music and you know, the 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 credits start rolling and this music just gives you this 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 joy and relief for having finished this game, which wasn't as like nearly as hard as Super Mario Brothers was, but you know it had its own level of challenge to be sure. And it's just it's some of the most perfect ending music I've ever heard. And Koji Kondo has done some really really astonishing ending musics before. I mean, wait till we get to Legend of Zelda: Link to the Past episode. Holy crap! But uh, Tanaka really knew what to do when it came to ending musics. I mean, some of his stuff is really, really spot on, and this is really one of his finest, finest works. It has pieces that harken back to Super Mario Brothers. It has pieces that kind of feel like it harkens back to other songs in this game. It does all the things that Tanaka music does well. It has those high bass notes that really just kind of fill you with nostalgia and you know, that mid-afternoon playing a game by yourself in the summer feeling that just, it's flawless. It is absolutely flawless. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece of music, and I'm so happy to be able to end an episode on a song this good. So here is track number 22, Rocket Ship Ride. It's about as perfect as an ending song could possibly be, and definitely uh, a highlight as far as ending music in Super Mario Brothers go, which is a high watermark because there's some really, really good music for conclusions of Mario games. But Rocket Ship Ride's got to be one of my all-time favorites. It's just, it's just such a great, great tune. 
And that's our show. <laughs> Thank you, everybody who has uh, tuned in and listened to us live. Uh, we, we've had a good time tonight, minus some uh, technical difficulties right in the beginning. Tune in next time when we'll be celebrating the 20th anniversary of The Virtual Boy with another special live episode. As always, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts and memories on this game, so if you like, you can send them to mail at geekade.com. We'll fill you in on all the details soon through our regular media channels about scheduling and when exactly the uh, next uh, soundtrack wave pack episode is going to be, uh, which you should totally subscribe, follow, and like if you haven't already. So uh, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, uh, like us on the Twitters, and all those things. We're all available. Uh, and while you're at it, check out some of the great content we have over at geekade.com. Thanks again for listening, and have a great night.